went on to work at DuPont as a process engineer. I had a very interesting career in the Washington world of very many uh, diverse roles, I should say, along the years. Um, uh, in particular, after she worked at uh, DuPont, she subsequently went on uh, to do a uh, dual master's degree uh, at Stanford University. And one of those master's degrees was uh, an MBA, and the other one was a, uh, a master's in manufacturing systems. So she did both engineering and an MBA. And uh, that dual preparation really um, laid the groundwork for a lot of interesting things that she did subsequently. Uh, she proceeded um, around that time to also work at a company called Raycan, which was a um, materials company. Um, and after Raycan, uh, many years later, she subsequently uh, transitioned into a role as CEO. Uh, she's currently the CEO of a venture-funded clean tech startup, which specializes in uh, electric motors. And she'll uh, I'm sure have a lot to tell us about these activities. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Raj, and I'm very happy to be here. So I, I want to talk a little bit about entrepreneurship from my point of view. I know that a lab partner of mine, Deb Gruby, was here at the end of August talking about entrepreneurship from a big company point of view. And what I want to talk about is more what I have been involved with is venture-backed uh, startups, technology-based startups. So I'll go ahead. So the title of this is Building on a Technical Foundation, because you're all here at a wonderful university getting a great degree in engineering, where you really are getting to understand some technologies in a very clear way. I have a kind of a, another subtopic title for this talk is, I think in, engineer, in entrepreneurship, sometimes having a technical education is not enough. You need more than that. So let me talk about how you build on this wonderful background that you're getting now. So I want to do a couple of some definitions, but mostly talk about entrepreneurship and how engineering applies to entrepreneurship. And then I'll talk more specifically about venture capital and raising money. That's a big part of how I spend my time now, is funding this great technology. I'll talk about my story and my company, and then make some general observations. And then I have a few ideas for things you might think about doing if you're interested in, in a, an entrepreneurship career at some point. And then we'll have time for Q&A. So you know all about chemical engineering, so I don't need to define that for you, other than saying it tends, when you think about these large-scale manufacturing, you tend to think about very large companies. In fact, when I was here as an undergrad, I thought I had two possible career paths. One was academic, go and get a graduate degree and stay in academia and research, and the other was to join a very large company, and that was kind of my choices. And I chose joining a very large company with DuPont. Now, one definition for being an entrepreneur is actually quite different than that. And as you can see, it has more about how do you apply technology, in my case, because I'm going to talk about entrepreneurship for technical companies. If you, take, if you add this whole element of risk and initiative. And my experience with very large companies is you often spend your time reducing risk. You're actually not out looking for it. And in the case for entrepreneurship, you know, the bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity, right? Bigger the risk, the bigger the rewards might be. So it's a, it's a different kind of mindset. So when I think about what, what makes an entrepreneur, a lot of it is having the vision and the passion and the desire to really transform an industry, to make a huge difference. And so when I think about successful entrepreneurs that I have known, they often, they typically always have these kinds of qualities, right? They really want to create something. They have high energy. They often have low sleep requirements. A lot of like grad students. They're very adaptive and flexible. You know, you think you have a plan. And so there's this trade-off as an entrepreneur between, you know, usually we're opportunity rich. And in fact, there's a saying in Silicon Valley, where I live, that more small companies die of indigestion rather than starvation. Meaning, there's so many opportunities, you try to do way too much, and you end up doing none of them very well. And that's when the company fails. As opposed to starvation when you don't have enough things to do. So you're trying to both be adaptive to opportunities, but yet stay focused and not chase after the next shiny object that flies by. 
And so that's a constant challenge, right? So, so you're marrying this adaptivity, being flexible to persevering, because a lot of times there's a lot of failure involved. And so, you know, when to hold them, you know, when to, you know, how, how do you move forward, right? And I've talked about risk taking before, right? There's a term I've heard from a company called IDEA, which is a product design company in Palo Alto, and they talk about looking for T-shaped people. And what they mean by the T-shape is that they are very deep technically. They really understand some area very, very well, and that's the deep part of the T. That's what you're all here doing now. But there's also the top part of the T, where they're looking for a broad set of skills. And maybe they're not as deep, they won't be as deep as the bottom of the T, but they're deep enough. Right? That you know what you don't know. You know when to get more expertise in it. So I think entrepreneurs are T-shaped people. Optimistic, right? You can't get down about things, right? You always have to have hope. You always have to believe that the next experiment or the next customer you talk to or the next venture capitalist you talk to is going to be the one, right? So you always have to believe. Entrepreneurs handle failure, right? And you can feel bad for a little while, but then you have to pick yourself up and go back at it. And in fact, after a time, you learn, you learn that you learn more from failure than you learn from success. So to be able to look objectively at what happened and what part do you own and what part's something else and how do you learn better next time. And you'll hear this theme for me today, it's all about communication. Because no matter how good your idea is, if you can't tell somebody about it, and you can't get them excited about it, whether it's a new employee or an investor or a customer, you're not going to succeed. So it's extremely important that you're able to communicate your passion and your vision and why you're doing what you're doing. And I think it's all summarized by the note at the bottom, which is I think for entrepreneurs, the fear of missing an opportunity is greater than the fear of failure. And that's what keeps them going, is wanting to get the next big opportunity, to solve the next big problem in a big way. And so what about the technical skills, which is what you're obviously spending a lot of time gaining here at Purdue. I'd say they're necessary, but not sufficient to be an entrepreneur. You know, for me in a high-tech startup, it's table stakes. You have got to be strong technically. And the better you are technically, the better off you'll be. Right? That's that deep part of the T. It's essential. But I think you need to add complementary skills, and that's the top part of the T. And some of the skills that I've found that I needed to gain, and some of these I did through going to school, but there's other ways you can gain it, is understanding finance and economics. And, and there's part of that that you learn in engineering. But then there's, I think, more to it than that to have a successful business. You have to be good, I think, on the people side. And sometimes I like to say that the soft stuff is the hard stuff. Being the people side is often the soft part of the skills. And so being able to hire great people, being able to build an organization, being able to let go of something and trust somebody else to get it done. Strong customer-facing skills, market-facing skills. It's one thing to be able to talk to engineers, and that's important, but there's a lot of other people in the world, I've got news for you, and you have to be able to talk to them too. And a lot of times, they are the people with the checkbook. And so you have to be able to know how to talk to customers, to be honest and tell them the way things are going, but be able to tell them in a way that they're still interested in doing work for you, right? To be able to tell them we've had a setback and a delay in the development, but here's what we're learning and here's where we're going, right? To be able to develop partnerships, these could be with employees, it could be with suppliers, it could be with customers, it could be with the government, you know, but the ability to work on a team and find a win-win, right? It's not a win-lose out there. You really have to figure out how everybody can win. You know, how to understand markets, how to create markets. A lot of times in an entrepreneur, you are creating a market that nobody knows. So you're talking to customers that don't know they need what you have. So you have to figure out how to create that market, right? To, uh, to be got, come to love lawyers, which I never thought I would say, but particularly in high-tech startups, the patent rights, the intellectual property is huge. And you have to know enough about that to be able to work with attorneys and find out how you protect your IP. Because sometimes that is the value that you bring. And finally, I'll say it again, the communication skills. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about the money. Because that's a big part of the difference between what I try to do with venture high-tech startups 
is needing the funding because typically you need a lot of money. You need money to hire people, you need money to build labs, manufacturing equipment. There's a lot of times you need millions of dollars, you know, more than your grandmother can lend you. And so that's when venture capitalists come in. So are you familiar with VCs? Have you heard of venture capital? Do you know much about it? Okay, so, so what v venture capitalists are are professional investors. They t in the high-tech world, they tend to all be engineers, so they all have technical training, but they're all interested in economics and in finance too. And so they fund startups. They fund startups with the idea that they'll fund 10 of them and one of them will be successful. So you go and pitch your story to them, and you convince them that they need to write you a check so that you can start your business. And the way it's all set up is there's different stages that you go through. So the first stage is often called angel investing or seed fund, and that might be for one or two people to run some lab experiments, right? This is the garage type startup that is so common. Angels might give you a few hundred thousand dollars, that kind of thing, would last you a year or two, right? And you prove the technology, right? You want to prove that the laws of physics are still intact, right? So you need to just prove on a small scale that your idea works. And then you go to Series A funding. That could be you know, the millions of dollars. And that's to actually develop a working prototype that someone might use. The next stage is Series B. And again, depending on the kind of business, depends on how long the stage is. So in the terms of software, they tend to be pretty short stages, right, for people to develop the software. For something like what I'm in now, which is electric motors, they're longer because it just takes more time to build prototypes and do experiments. Series B, so you, you're always at the milestone. So you always sort of sing for your supper with the venture capitalist, right? They give you some money, and then in exchange, you need to meet certain milestones or do certain things. And when you do, then you get the next round, right? So that's how it goes. So you can see B, Series D, you know, all the way to have a working, hopefully profitable business. Now, venture capitalists are in it for the money. That's why they do what they do. They have people that invest in them. They're limited partners. In fact, Purdue invests in venture capital funds, right, with some of their money, right, to, to get more back. And so what a venture capitalist has to do is they have to return the money back to the investors, right? Their investors gave them money with the idea that they were going to get more back later. The typical time frame is maybe five to seven years. So there has to be what's called a liquidity event, right? At some point, your company has to do something to make money for the investors. And that could be an, an initial public offering, an IPO. It might be an acquisition by a bigger company. That's very common. It might be some kind of buyout by private equity guys or employees. But they have to pay back their investors. They're not doing it because they're good guys and they love technology. They might be. But they're also doing it because it's their business, and that's what they, ha they have to do to stay in business. So here's some uh, typical venture capital areas. I think the first few are often, you find chemical engineers in them, right? And some of these you know, have, were really big a few years ago, but I mentioned them because there's still venture capital money there. The whole semiconductor business, you know, 20 years ago, this was huge. But there still is money going into faster, better, cheaper chips or, you know, insulating layers or equipment that you make. A lot of money going into clean tech. This is the space that I'm in. But even within clean tech, there's lots of sort of subcategories. And what you find is venture capitalists specialize in one of these areas, right? So all the wind in, so re, um, renewable fuels, right? Wind, solar, fuel cells, biofuels, that's all big. And I know Purdue's got things going in a lot of these. You know, batteries. I'm in energy efficiency. The line wasn't big enough to put energy efficiency, but that's a whole area. When you think of smart grids, right, smart buildings, um, that's all part of clean tech. And that's gotten a nice lift, at least in the past, because uh, the U.S. was putting a lot of money into the, the uh, energy field. So besides getting money from venture capitalists, startups could also get money from the government. So there's a lot of en energy going there. A lot, a ton of stuff in healthcare. I think that's going to continue. Um, I didn't put water on here, but there's a lot of stuff going on in water, communication software. So you get the idea. There's lots of different ideas. And I think for you, if you're interested in entrepreneurship or getting into some hot area. You need to find a place where there's a lot of growth and there's a lot of money going into it, a lot of investment. And this, I went through some of this before, but this is the kind of thing that venture capitalists look for. You know, the high returns I talked about. They'd like, if they give you a million dollars today, they'd like to get $10 million back in a few years. That's the kind of numbers they're looking for. So they're looking for big markets and high prof uh, profits. They're looking for 
intellectual property that's protected so they can have a legal monopoly on something. They're looking for large markets and growing markets, new markets. You know, they, act, they look at the business plan, they look at the exit strategy. Who, might, who cares about this business? Who might pay a lot for it? You know, they're looking for this ongoing value in the business and they look for an experienced, strong management team. So in my world, these are the kinds of things that I try to put together when putting together a, a startup company. So then I thought it would be interesting to talk to you a little bit about what one does to get a VC interested in your background and in your company. But I think this is a good skill for you to learn anyway. It's called an elevator pitch. And so have you heard of, anybody heard of an elevator pitch, what this is about? So you've got, the idea is you've got 30 seconds to tell somebody about your business. Enough to get them interested enough to say, here's my card, call me. I'd like to spend more time with you. And I think this is a good skill for you to have, whether you're an entrepreneur or not. You know, whether you're trying to get a date for someone, whether you're trying to get your major professor to agree, you know, with your thesis present proposal, whatever it is, I think the ability to speak in a language that people can understand in a few sentences is a wonderful life skill to have. So I found a video that I thought was helpful. So I'm going to try to show you. It's a, sh oops, it's a short video. Here we go. They can tell you better than I can. You're in an elevator. You have an audience. You found a potential customer or a potential investor, and that person's trapped with you for 30 seconds or a minute, and you need to get them hooked. An elevator pitch is a short, succinct statement that you can very well understand what the business is all about. The pitch that I initially created, I remember that. It was more focused on a problem that I was trying to solve, uh, and the, the technology that would go into solving that problem, one of the biggest issues that we have with people joining into the company is that they have a very long, complicated explanation of what my technology does. You've heard about big, big problem of technology for the day. Human record. It's not a technical description of the engineering that I'm venture. First and foremost, it's a prototype of your business. One of my first responsibilities when I came on board was to go see angel investor or VC funding. I figured I'm only going to have 30 seconds with these folks. And while I can't tell them everything, I need to figure out how to get their interest. A good elevator pitch is when I uh, immediately think, I need to know more about this. Tell me more. What you need to do is, is really get the basic facts out. What kind of business you're in? Who's it for? What things are special? And how are you going to make money? We had to write reams of material to create different elevator pitches and then narrow it down. You start to apply filters. Is there technical jargon in there? Get rid of it. If there's a language in there, then acronyms. Get rid of it. If there's something that isn't absolutely core to your business, get rid of it. Home traffic, home energy efficiency. 
I first started doing smart HVAC, we used those innovative sensors, smart algorithms, and wireless battery operated smart lights. It enables us to learn unique living patterns based on those equipment. Oh, sorry. To learn patterns, then we can condition only the hot vectors, thereby improving that work while saving 30% in energy use. So, how's that? <laughs> Okay, we'll let Chevron get their little ad then. There. So that's about the elevator pitch. And, and there's more hours than you can imagine that goes into the planning those 30 seconds. <laughs> but it's very important in, in lots of ways. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, you know, a few personal examples of where I came from and how did I get, you know, never did I think when I was sitting in the Kimmy building that I'd ever be CEO of a motor company, right? Way too much mechanical and electrical stuff going on for this Kimmy. But, you know, it's interesting when you look backwards how you can connect the dots of sort of why you got where you got, right, what you were doing. So Raj talked a little bit about this, but I started in a very traditional chemi way, right, is working with DuPont. Part of what I did there was work with fluoropolymers in the Viton plant. After graduate school, I ended up joining a company called Raychem, and again, I was working with polymers. In fact, I met Raychem when I was at DuPont. I was asked to give a technical presentation to Raychem about oil field polymers, downhole applications. And so that's when I met Raychem, was actually as part of DuPont. And so then, as with Raychem, I started off doing conductive polymers. I ended up making lots of changes because I was there for many years. And one of the things I did was move to North Carolina to run their telecom business. And when I was in North Carolina, um, the energy business was moved to North Carolina because they were trying to save money and shut some sites down. So I actually got into the energy business, right? So you can see where this is going right now that I'm in the energy field. Then Raychem was acquired. Um, as part of that, they shut down corporate R&D and they started a venture capital group, a corporate VC group, not unlike what you saw with Chevron there. So I was part of that VC group. So then now I'm starting to see more about startups and business plans and how people invest in these companies. I eventually um, left Tyco when the venture capital business was not a good fit for their corporate climate. I joined a company called Aver Averon for a short time. They ended up getting acquired as well. And they did ingestible, in, uh, inhalable flu vaccines. Totally different field, but it was very fun actually to work on it. Um, <laughs> I'm a farm girl, so it's very interesting to work with the chicken embryos. Then um, I joined a company called Capstone Turbine that makes microturbines. And again, that was sort of leveraging off of that energy business that I'd done before. I went to Apexon, which made enterprise software for uh, quality management and supplier management, and then joined Novatorque and Electric Motors and Cleantech. So Capstone Turbine was really a Cleantech company before Cleantech was known to be uh, Cleantech. So I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about Novatorque, what we're doing now, and, and why, that's, why, why that's interesting and why I sort of went there. So we're all about value in motors, right? So we offer the highest performance per dollar, and we talk about performance being in terms of energy efficiency, and we've got a very high efficiency over a broad range, very flat curve, and I'll show you what a curve looks like. We're smaller in size and lighter in weight. That's going to end up mattering for battery-operated applications like electric vehicles or forklifts or golf carts. And we're very economical. A lot of these motors use rare earth materials, and if you happen to follow rare earth materials, they're quite expensive, and there's a supply issue. And we're able to use common ferrite magnets. So I get to, I get to use a little materials technology there. And the, the technology scales in terms of the product. It also scales in terms of manufacturing. And we've got a lot of great patents that are very defendable. Right? So you can sort of see the beginnings of why a VC might be interested in this product. I don't know if you can see this, but just a little bit of the background, because it'd be, I think, interesting for you to hear about the start of the company, because I wasn't there at the start. I think the best use you know, of what I get most excited about is being the second CEO. I like to come in after the science experiment's over, and we know that the technology works, and that I get involved in making it a commercial success. So I'll talk a little bit about John Petro, who was the founder, and who holds the patents, and who started this. So he started his R&D in 2003 as part of another company he founded that made high-performance oil field laboratory pumps. 
So he's a very much a niche business. And as part of that, he began working with magnetic valves and then decided he didn't like any of the motors that his suppliers were providing him and someone challenged him to make a better motor and he did. And so by 2005, he realized that the motor business had a greater opportunity than the pump business. So he sold the pump business to Amatec, and maybe you've heard of Amatec, it's a large motor mechanical company, sold it to Amatec and took the proceeds of that sale to fund Novatorque in the early stages. So he didn't use an angel investor, he actually sold company to pay for it, thinking that he would license the technology. So one reason he invested in writing really great patents and patenting it all over the world was he thought his exit was going to be to license it to big motor companies who would give him millions of dollars to get the IP. And it turns out they didn't want to do that for a couple reasons. One is they didn't have manufacturing capability to build the motor. It took some special skills that they didn't have. So John ended up going out to get venture funding, and by 2008, he had raised $10 million of Series A funding. And a part of that Series A funding was the requirement to bring in a CEO, an experienced CEO who had taken new technologies to market. And so that's when I came in, at that stage. So he'd proven the technology could work, but it wasn't clear that it was manufacturable or could be made in a cost-effective way. It wasn't clear that anyone would pay for it, right, and buy it in the marketplace. So John's now the CTO, I came in as the CEO. And to make a long story short, we now have our first product in production in Gen 2, it looks awesome. So we've, we're making the move, we raised our Series B funding this past year. This is a little bit in case anyone cares, or I can talk to you about it afterwards. What's magic about our motor is really the geometry. And so you know, if your neodymium ion boron is the rare earth material, it's got very high flux density. And so it's able to get very high efficiencies. And the reason we're able to do this with our technology is what's different is that conical shape in the rotor and in the uh, stator. And so our patents are anything between zero and 90 degrees. We don't own zero and we don't own 90, but we own everything else. So if anyone ever makes a motor and we cut it open and we see an angle between zero and 90, they're violating our patents. So they either need to stop production or pay us a royalty. All right, so that's an example of very strong patent because it's easy to enforce. And that's what enables us to use this low cost, very available um, iron oxide, ferrite magnet. So that's the magic. Here's a little bit, um, to, so you can see the value proposition for the customer. We're really competing against induction motors that have been around over 100 years. Nikolai Tesla invented them a long time ago. So probably if you've had much to do with motors, they've been these squirrel cage radial induction motors. And that's, you can see the bottom line, the purple, is the standard uh, induction motor. They have a high efficiency motor, and in order to make it higher efficiency, they have to add copper, they have to add steel, so they have to add cost and weight to get higher efficiency. The dotted line is a rare earth motor, and then you can see the red line is our Gen 1 motor, and so you can see not only is the efficiency higher, but it's also flatter. So it explains our first markets are looking at, at variable speed markets, like pumps and fans, like a car, electric vehicle. Anything that needs to go faster and slower, they care about efficiency at every point. So it's a little bit like when you drive your car or you're buying a car and you're interested in both the freeway driving MPG and the around the town MPG. You actually care, right, at both points. And so we're saying to customers, you don't have to choose now, right, whether you're going to be on the freeway or in town. You can use our motor and you can have high efficiency both places. Right? And then you can see Gen 2, which is the blue line at the very top, which has even higher efficiency than Gen 1. Right? This is classic sort of startup stuff that I'm showing you. Okay, so if now to look back, you know, nothing like retrospect. I never could have told you this in advance. But if I look at in the back in the rear view mirror now about how did I get to Novatorque? You can see that, you know, having these experiences with DuPont with fluoropolymers is what led me to Raychem, working with conductive polymers. Having that experience led me to North Carolina for this telecom business, right, where we're worrying about fiber and coax cable and twisted pair of copper. But then the energy business moved there, which so I ended up learning a lot about energy. So then I, in the venture capital background, getting into Capstone and then ultimately getting to Novatorque. So I sort of needed almost every one of those positions to get where I am today. So I couldn't have predicted it. So I think you know part of the message, at least from my story, is you have to be open to the possibilities. So then, then a few observations, right? As I kind of thought back about this and what uh, Dr. Varma asked me to talk about, 
You know, I think one message for you is opportunities are everywhere. You just have to look for them. And remember, the bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. So when you think you have an insurmountable problem, you can either get discouraged or you can get encouraged and say, wow, this is awesome. And once we've solved this, it's going to be great. I've also found out that usually when you hit one of those insurmountable problems, there are usually ways to solve it with existing resources. You know, when it looks like you can't possibly do it with the people you have or the funding you have or the equipment you have, often you can. You just have to, you know, get the right minds thinking very creatively about it. Some other lessons, and I've mentioned some of these already, is that you learn a lot from failures. So, you, you, you know, although it's hard to feel good about a failure, you really can make the most of it. And you will have failure. You should have failure. I mean, and certainly in the startup world, you know, our thinking is if you don't have some failures, then you're not pushing the envelope enough. You're not trying enough crazy ideas if everything you try works. You should have failures. You just need to learn from them, right? You don't want to make the same mistake twice, right? You want to make new mistakes. Um, creativity comes from action. You know, I haven't seen too many brilliant ideas coming from sitting around, right? Typically, you're trying something, right? You're talking to customers, you're running experiments, you're learning something new, you know, you're doing something. And I often hear about people saying they're lucky. Well, my observation is the harder you work, the luckier you get. I think there's a definite connection there. And these lucky people that work hard tend to be very observant. Right? They're curious about things. They notice things, right? They're open-minded. And this sounds like an odd word, but I think these lucky, hard-working people are also friendly, right? They're interested in getting to know people and understanding things. That's been my personal observation. Now, this next comment I actually learned as a freshman here at Purdue, which is to frame a problem more broadly. I think sometimes we get into trouble because we, we're thinking way too narrowly about the problem and the solution set. And so this example is one that I actually learned when I was 17 years old at Purdue, where we were in small groups trying to solve a problem. And the problem we were given was that in this building, it was all kinds of engineers. This is like in freshman engineering, so it's not a chemical engineering problem was uh, a building had grown, you know, the staffing had grown and people were having to wait for elevators too long. So the problem was, what do you do about all these people waiting for elevators? So the groups came up with a number of ideas, right? One was, you know, go to flex scheduling, right? Have more people come in early, more like spread out when people are in the building. Okay, that's pretty creative. One idea was, you know, knock out a wall, add another elevator, right, on the outside of the building. Okay, kind of expensive, but you know, get more flow rate through, right? If you do that, that might have been a chemical engineering suggestion. Um, an idea, you know, can you move the elevator faster between floors? Can you make the doors open and close faster? So there's some safety issues with that one. But the winning team came up with the idea of putting mirrors by every elevator so that people were so busy looking at themselves they forgot to complain about waiting for the elevator. Very low cost, immediately implementable solution. So they framed the problem more broadly. The problem wasn't how do you get elevators to move faster or more elevators. The problem was how do you get people to stop complaining about waiting for elevators. And that happens all the time about framing the problem more broadly. And then the last one, and I, I keep learning this one, but you need to care more about being successful than being right. I see people spending a lot of time trying to prove they're right, and they miss the whole point of what you're trying to get. Okay, so some thoughts about what you might think about, right? About yourself and then about others. You know, first of all, and again, these are my biases, my opinions, is I think it's really important to have a very broad worldview, right? That's bigger than Purdue, bigger than the Midwest, bigger than the U.S., because that's just the way the world is now. And, and it, you can become arrogant if you're just thinking about your way of thinking things. So whether it means traveling or getting an internship or studying or whatever it means, living abroad, I think there's an awful lot to be said for getting those kinds of experiences. You need to take your work seriously, right? To give it your all, to do your very best, but not take yourself too seriously, right? You, you can get in trouble if you take yourself too seriously. And this next one is from... Um, a woman named, I'm trying to remember her name, Tina Selling at Stanford. And I've heard her say, take, tell her students, 
to take every opportunity to be fabulous. And what she means about that is to get beyond the question of, is this on the test? Meaning, if it's on the test, I'll study it again. If it's not on the test, I'm not going to worry about it. And her comment is, go beyond what's expected. You just never know what you might learn and what it might lead to. My personal experience also is you need to be humble. Because success is awesome and it's very fun, but it's usually short-lived. So you just need to keep that in mind. Uh, be self-aware of yourself. You know, the impact you have on others, the impact they have on you, right? If you feel yourself getting angry about something, ask yourself, what's that all about, right? Or if you're loving what you're doing, what's, to just be aware of that. Because that can lead you in some new directions. Or it can lead you to have some very important conversations. So I think sometimes, particularly as engineers, we tend to minimize the whole kind of emotional, intuitive part of it. We might want to swallow it and not deal with it. But my experience has been, when you deal with it and you think about, why am I feeling this way? Or why do I think this is a bad idea? Or why do I think I should do this? What, what's going on here? They can often lead to some breakthroughs and some pretty interesting thoughts. And another one that I um, laugh about with my, the founder, John and I, because um, John is this brilliant genius, very passionate about anything he does. An idea a minute, right? So part of the, I guess I'll call it productive tension between us is, you know, how many of his ideas do we actually invest in and spend time developing and how many do we say, you know what, we're going to put those on the shelf for now because we've got to finish some other things? Is that he can get so excited about what he's doing and so passionate that when he says something, I think it's true. I think it's a fact. And I operate on it as if it's an axiom. And then it turns out that it was simply an opinion, and if that opinion wasn't right, then I've gone off and made decisions and other, other things. So part of our conversation now is, is this a fact or is this your opinion? Because I can deal with it, I just need to know which one it is, right? And you need to do that yourself. You have to be honest with yourself about that. And then about working with others, because such a big, big part, I think, of entrepreneurship, but I also think a big part of life, is working with other people. And my best advice for this is to give others the benefit of the doubt. It's easy to quickly jump to conclusions and to judge other people, but my experience is it's better to give them the benefit of the doubt, and that often is the right, usually is the right thing to do. If you do feel a conflict with someone else, rather than avoid it, it's better to lean into it and get through it. It typically only festers and gets worse. And again, I think for us engineers, sometimes it's easier to get off and do something that's quantitative because we're really comfortable with that. But it's better to just have the conversation. Figure out what the conflict's about. Don't take it personally. Just get through it. Respect others. And that could be things like being present when they're here, meaning like, OK, I'm going to sound like your mother, but you know, not checking your email on your phone when you're talking to somebody. You know, Be on time for things. Thank people for things. Um, that matters. It matters how you treat other people. And then I'll say, I think this is the last time I'll say it, is about communication. <laughs> it makes a difference. OK, so I think this is my last slide. So possible next steps for you. There, there is this Morgan Center for Entrepreneurship here on the campus, which wasn't here when I was here. But I have had a little bit of interaction with them. And it sounds like they've got some pretty neat things going on. They've got this certificate in entrepreneurship, which I think is some classes that you take. They offer a lot of business plan competitions. And so you can you know, go over there and find out what they ha have going on. Sometimes they have business school students or engineering students with ideas, and they marry people together for small groups. And the, the whole experience of being in a business plan competition is amazing. You just learn so much, whether your business plan is any good or not. And in fact, the little video clip I showed you is from the Clean Tech Open, which is a business plan, plan competition that Novatork uh, won one year. Right? So there's a lot of good that comes out of those. Um, from an honesty point of view, a lot of times in startups, you work for equity, you work for stock rather than cash. And that can be an issue. Right? That might not be where you are in your life. Or you work half equity, half stock, uh, half cash. So you have to know that that's part of the story with startups. You're always running out of money. There are these or entrepreneur fellowships that I know at least you know, a couple folks from Purdue have applied for. You can't see it, but it's orfellowship.org. And they actually hire new graduates and put them in startups in Indiana. There's some funding that comes from the state because they're trying to encourage more startups. If you're interested in working for a startup, you have to do a lot of it yourself. And startups don't have the money or the time to come to the placement office. 
And usually for the career center, you know, those appointments get made months in advance. You know, if we need somebody, we go look for them tomorrow, the day we need them. We don't look for them in advance. We can't because we don't know enough about the future and we don't want to commit cash unless we know for sure we need them. So if you're interested in working for a startup, you have to network to get them. And there's definitely ways to do it. You can look at the alumni files, you know, to talk to people and network, go to business plan competitions. Definitely ways to do it, but it's, it's not going to be going to Stewart Center. Or you can work for a large company in a hot new area. You know, that's a fun thing. You learn a lot of stuff from, from big companies, lots of spin-offs. You know, when you, and Silicon Valley is full of them. I mean, um, you know, a lot of folks from HP left HP to start 3Com or Cisco. You know, all these startups, right? Startups beget startups. That's part of the DNA. So working for a big company that's doing cool things will end up in a lot of spin-offs and startups. And so, of course, you know, Purdue can help you find some of those uh, startups or the big companies. And I'm bullish on being entrepreneurs. I think, you know, it's, fa it's a fact, this is not an opinion, it's a fact that most of the new jobs are created by new companies, right? So it's good for the economy. And I think the skills to be a good entrepreneur are good life skills to have, right? That you'll be able to use in your daily life, not just in, in starting a new company or joining a startup company. And that's it, thank you for your time. I'm happy to take questions. From my point of view, is actually I've worked overseas a few times. Uh, when I was at Purdue, I worked in research in Switzerland, doing boiling heat transfer as an undergrad. And as a grad student, I worked at the European community in Brussels, doing some public policy things. Um, and then after grad school, I worked for a company called McKinsey, which is a big consulting company in Australia. And then I worked with a joint venture in Japan. So for me, you know, a lot of my career has not been intentional, right? It's been grabbing an opportunity. In the case of international, I was actually very intentional about that. And once I, I initially wanted to do this work in France or in Switzerland, the French speaking part of Switzerland, because I could speak French and I wanted to use it for something. So. An odd reason, but I looked hard for a job in a French-speaking country. And then once I did that, I was hooked. I really realized how good that was for me, and I looked for other opportunities to work overseas. Yeah. You uh, talk about uh, how the report doesn't, doesn't rely on uh, gold medals, or gold, or Rare, gold medals yeah. to have the better motors. If you did switch the, the existing geometry to rare metals, would they be slightly better? Absolutely. Yeah, it would be even better. It'd be higher efficiency and smaller size and lighter weight. Yeah, it's just that cost-benefit trade-off. They'd also be very expensive. Yeah, and we've actually avoided some of the military applications that would be interested in that because we wanted to, you know, our goal is to have this technology be ubiquitous and to really be a brand new sort of motor technology offering and go down that learning curve. And the way to do that is to make it, you know, very broad applications, not especially for the military. Those have long sales cycles and they tend to not buy very many. Yeah, yeah. So the question was the customer. So for our first market, we're looking at HVAC, heating, venting, ventilation, air conditioning markets, because it's a, a large established market and we can replace the current motors. So we picked that more because it was faster to market. So this would be uh, compressors, fans, pumps kind of things. And so the customers for that are systems integrators. So there, there are these, we started out with small size companies because we can't manufacture very much. So we didn't want to sell to train or carrier, you know, one of these really large companies because they would order too many and we wouldn't be able to produce them fast enough. So there are actually these sort of uh, custom places like, you probably have never heard of these, Govern Air, Aon, Hunt Air, folks that like specialize, like they just make them for institutions, like just for universities. They make these big air conditioning air handling systems. And so they want to buy maybe 10,000 a year. 
So we started with them. So we sell to these systems integrators, and then they're the ones that sell to Wendy's or Walmart or to universities or hospitals. Well, that's what the VCs will tell you. The question was, you know, the sort of the time horizon and the the payback they're looking for. They'll typically tell you that that's what they're looking for. They need to, at least one in ten to be very successful, not moderately successful. And they're looking for at least a 10x return. And so they'll talk to you about that because when they when you give them your business plan, and there'll be numbers in the business plan, right? That says we'll make this many sales this year and this many next year, and here's what the profits will look like. And then they make whatever adjustments to your spreadsheet they think they should because they probably think you've been too optimistic, right? So they'll scale them back to whatever they look for. And then they look for an exit, right? So they'll say who will value you at how much in three years or five years, whether it's an IPO or an acquisition, and they do the math. It's it's it comes down to numbers and what they believe in. Now look at comps, right? I mean, what have other businesses done like you? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, do you, I noticed that you hear that there's very certainty across the world, across different organizations, and different types of organizations. Um, would you say that that was an advantage or a disadvantage to what you do now, where you're, you're getting a customer? Yeah, so the question was about kind of the serpentine <laughs> way of my career and what do, basically what do I think about that, right? Could it have been more effective or other ways to get there? You know, I think everybody figures out their own path. You know, in my case, I had some personal things going on, right? I have four kids, right? And, and I wanted to balance work and family. And so I would make choices about jobs based on how much travel there was, could I work from home, you know, so part of that serpentine nature was my choice because it was important to my husband and I that we have a family and that we be a big part of them in their lives. And so he and I balanced our careers, right? One of us would take a job that would stay at home and the other one would take one that travels. So, so some of that serpentine was a personal choice to, to make that work. You know, I worked part time for a while, I job shared for a while. So I'm happy to talk about the work-life balance thing, but part of those choices were mine around that. Yeah, yeah. So the question was about really the risk, right? And and uh, you know, because certainly more startups fail than are successful. The ones that fail, you know, we used to talk about this a lot, right? That if you're going to fail, fail early, right? I mean, the worst thing you can do is, you know, and I've probably the most public failure recently is Solyndra. If you follow the news at all, Solyndra was a big solar company that had 1,100 employees and just declared bankruptcy a few weeks ago. And so that's horrible. I mean, the benefit to us is we've actually hired some of their best people. So we've tried to make the best out of that situation that we could. But, you know, you don't want a thousand people to be affected, right? Typically the startups that fail have a handful of people, right? Maybe a half a dozen people or 10 people. So the number of companies is a little misleading versus um, how many people were affected. And so one reason there's that staged gate approach with venture capitalists is for every round of funding, the, the goals become higher, right? Whereas to get a little bit of seed funding, you just need to show a couple experiments or equations that suggest this might work. And that's enough to get a little bit of money. For the next stage, you, you know, so every time when they put more money in, you have to show more proof that the technology will work. You know, when we've gotten money, the VCs have called our customers, right? They've checked our references. You know, they do a lot of due diligence on all of this. So, and a lot of times when one startup fails, it becomes another startup, right? So those people will have another idea and can get funding for it and, and do something else, right? You often hear of serial entrepreneurs, where I am, right? Folks that love to start things. So they start them and get them to a certain point and then other people, finishers, and I'm one of the finishers, come in and take it to the next level, right? To get it to the customers, to get it to full volume production, to get it to whatever the exit might be. 
But as certainly a lot of startups fail. There's no, no question about that. And you know, you'll hear from people. Well, let's talk about Steve Jobs a minute, right? Because he's in. You know, a lot of folks are thinking about Steve at the moment. But you know, he started Apple, which of course was a great success. But then when he left Apple, he started Next, which was not such a success, right? And so. Okay, that, you know, as long as he can articulate why it didn't succeed and what he's going to do differently next, that could be an advantage, right? So that's, I think that's that optimistic part of being an entrepreneur, that you want to learn from what you can and present how you're going to leverage that with the next, you know. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, uh, in your time in D.C., if you noticed any like, trends or commonalities between successful startups and those that fail, yeah, so the question is, you know, as a VC, how do you predict? And of course, if someone could do that, <laughs> that would be a great thing. And I was only in venture capital for about a year or so. So I, I'm not a good an person to answer that, but I can tell you what other people have told me. And that's what I put up on the list about what VCs look for. And one of the things they often look for is an experienced management team. And there are times, you know, they used to say if Mark Andreessen, who started Netscape, you know, had an idea, anyone would fund him, right? That if you get a successful entrepreneur, that then they can get funding for the next one. So a lot of times it is if that person has been successful before. If the space is interesting, if the market's big enough, if there's enough strong IP. You know, so the list I put up there is really what VCs look for. And there is no guarantee. I mean, now obviously, they still have a you know, one in 10 hit rate for a really big one. So they haven't figured it out either, but it's not one in 100, right? So they've gotten it that, that much better. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that in the beginning, uh, as you start up a company, risk is almost above a challenge and opportunity. And then as the company matures, it becomes something to avoid at almost all costs. If, if that company started as an initial as a startup company, what catalyzes, in your opinion, that transition from risk as an opportunity to risk as something that should be avoided? Is it just how many people are in the company and you want to minimize it before you learn to protect your employees, or is it uh, some kind of internal? Yeah, so if you all heard that, you have a big voice, so all about risk, right? And, and why is it the small companies embrace risk and, take, and are more flexible to take it and large companies seem harder to? I think some of it is the inertia of a large company. I think some of it is, as you get bigger and bigger, you have to have some systems in place just so it's not chaos. You know, in Novatorp where I am now, I joined as employee number six, and now we're up to about 40. And even just going from six to 40, you know, without thinking of the 100,000 employees DuPont had, right, or whatever the number was, you find that actually suddenly you need some systems in place or how we're going to do things. You need a common language. You need a form to fill out. And so some of our early people will just roll their eyes at filling out a form, right, for expense reports. They used to just throw receipts on somebody's desk and get a check. Well, as you get bigger, you get audited. You know, it, it, some of it's just normal, you know, with bigger companies, um, you just need some of those systems in place. And you can get in trouble if you don't have the big ones. I think some of it is, you know, if big companies, and I know 3M used to be really good at this, and I think Raycam was good at it, they would do small scale experiments. So they took a lot of small risks. They didn't often take a bet your company kind of risk. And I think when you're a small startup, almost everything you do is a bet your company kind of risk, because that's all you've got the money to do, right, is to place one big bet. And I think as you get bigger, you know, some of it is you've got investors or shareholders, or if you're a public company, there's legal requirements, right, in terms of, of managing the risk. So, so I don't know of any super large companies that have found a way to take big risks. I think they take more small risks. But there's a way to keep that kind of spirit a lot, maybe in more packaged deliveries, maybe. Yeah, I hope so. I think, you know, that has been elusive for companies. And a lot of times, you know, Apple's found a way to do it. You know, Apple's a pretty big company, and they still come out with really innovative products. But a lot of big companies, it just it, it does get harder. And the people that love that, you know, and I'm thinking of some of our founding company, you know, folks. And I think a lot about how do I keep this place exciting enough for them that they'll want to stay, right? Because it used to be with six people. If you had a great idea in the morning, you came in, called everybody together, forget what we decided yesterday, we're going to do this today, right? And everybody does this, and they're excited about that. The adrenaline is high. 
But now that we have customers and we have commitments to deliver motors for them, we can't do that now, right? We can't eat if we do that. You know, we have to make motors the same way with the smallest variation possible to ship to the customers. So you find yourself saying, okay, let's have this kind of wild-eyed R&D group over here, but we have to have a wall to let the people doing manufacturing to deliver high-quality products on time. But then inevitably, manufacturing has problems, they want R&D to come in, or R&D has some ideas, and they want manufacturing to come help. And so it's, it's a constant tension. I don't have the answer, but it's a, it's a noble idea to think about how do you do that. Um, as a uh, growth, is there an exit strategy I mean, you have VC funding that you need, or are you looking to become kind of a household name in direct motors? Yeah, so we have to have an exit because our VCs will demand an exit, right? If we don't come up with one, they will. So we definitely want to be in control of that. I think the most likely exit for Novatorque will be a, another large, not another, a large motor company or drive company. Because we're a manufacturing company, so we need working capital, we need capital equipment, you know. It's, uh, it's different than a VC type business. So I think it's hot and more likely than say an IPO that we become a, a, a standalone, you know, multi-billion dollar motor company. There's a lot of them in the world today. You know, I think there's probably 20 or 25 billion dollar plus motor companies in the world. So I think the, you know, part of my job, right, is to make sure that when it's time for some sort of M&A activity, we have many people interested in it, so we get the most possible, you know, the highest price that we can. So I will not have done my job if only one company wants to buy us when the time comes. Any other questions? Okay, let's get this